Thank you. Yeah. All right. And we're back. What? Okay. So, verse 12. And Hashem said to Moses, say to Aaron, reach out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, and it shall become lice in the land of Egypt. And they did so. And Aaron reached out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the earth. Dust of the earth. Hebrew. Uh, Adamah. Adamah. Okay, where we get the word Adam from. Okay. Man, Adam, which means mankind in Hebrew, is made from Adamah, the soil, and what flows in your bodies is Adam, blood. So you're actually, to make up that, you're in two parts. Okay? So when you look at the Hebrew, it actually starts to paint the picture. You have Dom, you're from the earth, and here, very specifically, I think he has this whole play of, you are nothing but dust. And you are declaring yourself gods. Who are you? And sadly, in this world today, we have people who are more interested about their brand, making it out there, than their testimony. Is there a possible reason why the plagues are very similar in the Revelations that comes from the people of the world? Absolutely. Every time when you look at Revelations, they actually parallel a lot of these plagues. Because God is going to be doing the same thing here. You do not understand the plagues and Revelations unless you understand the story. God is teaching for a specific purpose to get you back to Him. He's not shaking heavens and the earth to just show you how awesomely powerful He is. He's doing it to save you. And sadly, as is in the case here, we read in Revelations that they trust rather in their gods than they do in their making tissue. Okay, these things will... It's a very interesting study. Go do it. If, you, if you're interested, go look at the parallels and things like that. They come back continually. All right? There's a very another... Well, I'm well we here. When we talk about a sacrifice, you know, when you go into the altar, you put the blood on the altar. When you make it a lay offering, okay? Here's your altar. The blood done goes down, and the rest of it goes up, which is a lay, which is a play on the symbol of the lay. Okay? So as that which is of the earth, and that which is of God, the very breath that He gives you, actually ascends while the blood returns to where it comes from. Interesting thoughts. Listen to those who do the Hebrew. Alright. Uh, okay, where are we now? 16. Here's one fight. 16? Struck the dust of the earth, and it will become a lies in the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they did so. And Aaron reached up out of the of his hand and he stopped and he struck the dust of the earth. And the lies were in which were in the, in the humans and in the animals. All the dust of the earth was lies in the land of, in all the land of Egypt. It's a very interesting statement for those who shave their heads, their eyebrows, their arms, and all the rest of it. Egyptians didn't like body hair. They thought it looked funny. You were kind of cavemanish. All right, the Hebrews, very body hair. All right, and yeah, you have this moment where all of this lice is affecting them. But this is impossible. We're all clean and civilized, and civilized and superior and stuff. And the magicians did so with their charms to bring out the lice, and they were not able. Plagues one, two, three, replicated. God picks up the pace. There's no words. This is where I start to show you who I am. And there was lies over the humans and the animals. And the magician said to Pharaoh, understand the statement. These guys believed that they had the powers received from Ra, from Isis, from Osiris. All of these funny little plays and these things. And they turn around and say, it's the finger of God. That is a Hebrew idiom for saying, by His Spirit, this is happening. 
when someone as pagan as someone who is, in a sense, demonically influenced, turns around and goes, Whoa, this is God. Pay attention. They start to panic. And Pharaoh's heart was strong, and he did not listen to them, as Hashem had spoken. And Hashem said to Moses, get up early in the morning and stand in front of Pharaoh here. He's going out to the water. And I start to think, really are we not sensing a pattern here? He will go and worship at the Nile even though he saw the Nile die. He saw his, his gods being taken on one for one, but he is still continuing to push. And you will say to him, Hashem said this, let my people go so that they may serve me. Because if you're not letting my people go here, I'm causing an insect swarm to, to be let go on you and on your servants and on the people and on your houses. And, and the houses of Egypt will be filled with an insect swarm and also on the ground that they're on. And I shall distinguish in that day the land of Goshen on which my people is standing. For no insect swarm will be there, so that you will know that I am Hashem and in with, and am within the land. And I shall set the distinction between my people and your people. This will be a sign for you tomorrow. God's pattern is the same. He promises something, he fulfills it, he gives you a symbol. This is what's going to happen. Okay? So when we start looking at the different plagues, just to summarize a little bit back. Okay? We have the first plagues, one, two, and three is to show that He is real. It says here in verse 17, By this you will know that I am God. He starts to change His point here. Okay? From plagues 4, 5, and 6, it says, I shall distinguish between my people and you. So the plagues are going to happen all around Egypt, except where His people are in Goshen. Okay? So where before it kind of affected the entire land, because He also needed to teach the Hebrews, that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They start to panic and he goes, no, no, no. Now I want to show them about my protection. I want to show them that I can distinguish this. This isn't just a weird natural phenomenon that affects everybody. In the midst of this, I will protect them. And Hashem did so. And a heavy insect swarm came to Pharaoh's house and his servants' house. And in all the land of Egypt, and the land was corrupted because of the insect swarm. And Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and he said, Go and sacrifice to your God in the land. Make an offering here. Pharaoh is still trying to dictate and control what's going to happen. And Moses said, it is not right to do so because we'll be sacrificing to Hashem our God an offensive thing to Egypt. Here we'll be sacrificing an offensive thing to Egypt before their eyes and they will stone us. Remember, they worshipped rams. They worshipped calves. These are the very things that would be offered up. Okay, so how can we do this in front of them? They're going to completely freak out and they're going to say, we're killing something holy. Funny that God is busy doing it for them. We'll go up on a trip three days into the wilderness and we'll sacrifice to Hashem our God whatever He'll say to us. And Pharaoh said, I'll let you go and you'll sacrifice to Hashem your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go far. Pray for me. He's kind of holding on to the string. He says, oh, please don't go too far, but I need you to intercede for me again. And Moses said, here I'm going out from you, and I'll pray to Hashem that the insect swarm will turn away from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow, <coughs> as you have said. And only let Pharaoh not continue to toy so that not to let the people go and sacrifice to Hashem. Warning. Moses said to Pharaoh, went out from Pharaoh, and he prayed to Hashem, and Hashem did according to Moses' word, and the insect swarm turned away from Pharaoh, and from his servants, and from his people. Not one was left. And Pharaoh made his heart heavy this time as well, and he did not let the people go. Despite, go back to my ways. Okay? I want to go, wait, oh, Pharaoh, you're such a schmuck, I can't believe you're doing this, but I did this myself. Every time you go to a rough time, you cry out to God. And then He saves you from your difficulties, and then you go back to living the exact same life you were before. And every time we kind of justify why it's okay, why it's not the right time, why I don't really understand, so what's the point? 
I don't really have time right now. It's not for me. We're on different paths. I've heard this many, many times. We justify why we should walk away from God and carry on doing what we're doing. And God lovingly continues with us, teaching us, bringing us back, fighting for us. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Hashem said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh and speak to him. Hashem, God of the Hebrews, said this, Let my people go so that they may serve me. Because if you refuse to let go, and you are still holding on to them, here Hashem hand is on your livestock that are in the field and on the horses and on, on the donkeys and on the camels and on the oxen and on the flock a very heavy, heavy epidemic and Hashem will distinguish between Israel's livestock and Egypt's livestock and not a thing of all that Israel has will die and Hashem has said on that appointed time saying tomorrow Hashem will do this thing in the land and Hashem did this thing on the next day and all Egypt's livestock died, and all of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. And Pharaoh said, and yet not even one of Israel's livestock has died. So he went to check it out. And Pharaoh's heart was heavy, and he did not let the people go. And Hashem said to Moses and to Aaron, take handfuls of furnace ash, and let Moses fling it up into the skies before Pharaoh's eyes. Notice, there's no warning about this coming tomorrow. All of a sudden, this picks up this. Yeah? The furnace ash, was that the ash from the earth? Or are there some pagan god thingy that that's the ash from the earth? Is that from Molech? Well, it wasn't from Molech. No, well, I was asking if that was. From yeah, it wouldn't have been from Molech, but I definitely think you have, you're on the right track. It would be a public altar. So whatever they have offered up here, Worshipping a God, he takes the very ash of what's left and he throws it up in the air. Okay? Okay, right? so it was obviously again in a public place. Was it also uh, an assurance to them that God uh, remembered the, his covenant with them and that he's going to deliver them as a promise to Abraham before? And he's already reaffirmed that before, but he's going through the processes of dealing with that. So it's still. But I think yeah, he's playing it. He's still playing against their gods, their gods, their gods. I'm the only true God. Okay. And it will become a powder on the land of Egypt, and it will become a boil breaking out into sores on humans and on animals in all the land of Egypt. And they took the furnace ash and stood in front of Pharaoh, and Moses flung it into the sky, and it was boil breaking out in the in the sores and in the humans and in the animals. And the magicians were not able to stand in front of Moses on account of the boils. Because the boil was on the magicians, or was also on the magicians in the northern region. So now he's even pushing the point that even the magicians who are able to replicate certain things, who have now declared it's the face of God, even they will understand that they cannot stand before him. And Hashem strengthened Pharaoh's heart the first time you hear about it. People will say, that while well, God strengthened Pharaoh's heart, because there's a couple of verses in the beginning that says, you know, for this purpose I have raised him up. His purpose was to be taught, not to be destroyed. His purpose was to teach him and to show the world, to show the Egyptians, to show the Hebrews who God really was. If I can affect the superpower, I can change people's perceptions. And sadly, they fight against it every time. Okay. The hardening of the heart, I've heard one guy um, tell a little story on this very issue. And he said there was a, it's a little story and he said there was a family that, <coughs> that uh, were very poor and did not have any food to eat and, uh, and there was an atheist man that walked past them and saw them, that they were poor and that they didn't have any money and he said, your God is not helping you. And one day he heard them pray for having food and he thought he's going to teach them a lesson so he decided he's going to appear and, uh, and he's going to leave food in front of the doorpost and he went off going, he knocked on the door and went off and hid behind the bush. And then they opened the door and they saw this food and they praised God and the atheist jumped up, no it wasn't God, it was me. And the woman said, my goodness, God even uses people like you to give us <laughs> 
But in that process, that is how I see this. But, um, God used Pharaoh to do his, his will. And you can see it that he hardened the heart of the atheist to do that act. But in, he accomplished what God wanted. That's the thing. We have, we have a line drawn in the sand. You can either choose to stand, listen to what God is trying to show you, to show you how He reveals Himself, and to take all those testimonies of those times when He's reached into your life, and He answered your prayer. No one else's, your prayer. And He showed you that He was real, and that He's listening, and that He loves you, and that He's there. And you can take that, and you can either go stand with Him, or as soon as you get a little bit of respite from your troubles, you go stand against Him. Let me tell you very plainly, God will have His glory at your expense or through you. He is busy teaching the world. You have a choice. You can either stand with Him or you can stand against Him. Pharaoh, unfortunately, and I'm sure God mourned for this, He literally took heaven and earth and He shakes it to get Pharaoh's attention to teach it. And sadly, He didn't want to know anything. He chose continually to stand against this God. And Hashem strengthened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them. And Hashem had spoken to Moses. And Hashem said to Moses, get up early in the morning and stand in front of Pharaoh. And you'll say to them, Hashem, God of the Hebrews, said this, let my people go so that they may serve me. Because this time I'm sending all my plagues at your heart. I'm going to break down this barrier completely and set your servants and at your servants and at your people so that you all know that there is no one like me in the land. Plague 7, 8, 9 and probably 10 says God has no equal. These are things that cannot be done. Because by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with the epi uh, epidemic. And you would have been obliterated from the land. And in fact, I established you for this purpose. For this purpose of showing you my power. And in order to tell my name in all the earth. There's a little thingy, verse 17, you should say, but you are elevating yourself against my people. By not letting them go. Here, I'll be, sh I'll be showering at this time tomorrow a very heavy hail. That here hasn't been one like it in Egypt from the day of its founding until now. And now send, protect your livestock. Listen to the instruction. He goes, send, tell them, protect your livestock and everything that you have in the field. Every human and every animal that is found in the field and and will not be gathered into the house. Well, sorry, and will not be gathered into the house. The hell will come down on them and they'll die. We have a choice. When God sends out a warning and He says, this is what's going to happen tomorrow, you can believe Him or don't. Sadly, the repercussions are yours today. Okay? We need to understand what God is doing. We need to understand where we are. We need to understand the times. And He is telling you time and time and time again, He will fulfill what He has promised. Whoever feared Hashem's word among Pharaoh's servants... <coughs> Had his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. And whoever did not pay heed to Hashem's word left his servants and his livestock in his field. These people's arrogance caused the death of his servants. Pharaoh's arrogance is causing his people to suffer. What are you bringing to the people? What fruit are you bringing? Are you bringing life or are you bringing arrogance and death? How are you reflecting God in your circumstances when things are going in people's lives, wilderness moments, plagues or wonders, where God is, waits for the last minute to lift them up and to protect them, to separate themselves? Are you telling them to be strong and trust in God? Or are you telling them like um, some other people in Scripture saying, why don't you just curse God and die? He's not real. Why are you praying? If you fear God's word, if you trust Him, that He will bring about what He says is going to happen, we need to be there standing there as evidence for it. And Hashem said to Moses, reach out your hand at the skies and let there be hail in all the land of Egypt, on humans and on animals and on all vegetation in the field of the land of Egypt. And Moses reached out his hand with the staff in the skies and 
Hashem gave out thunders and hell and lightning went to the ground. And Hashem showered hell on the land of Egypt and it was hail with lightning flashing, flashing in the hell. Very heavy that there had not been anything like it in the land of Egypt since the time it became a nation. Yeah. My translation says, so there was hell and fire mingled with the hell. Lightning. Lightning is fire. Fire from hell. Lightning. Okay. What we need to understand is that it's hailstones so big that it can kill cattle. Stop thinking just humans. This thing can kill a bull left out in the field. Revelations talks about hailstones that weigh something like 35 kilos. It's coming. What God has done is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's teaching His people. I am real. I can distinguish between my people and not. And I have no equal. God's heart is to save His creation, not destroy it. And He will use anything and everything in His power to get you to choose life. That is the most ridiculous thing. Even in the midst of all of this, they had a choice to make. And they kept on choosing death. And because they chose death, their household was affected with death. Their servants died. Their animals died because of their arrogance. And I wish I could say this was an isolated incident, but it's going to come back. There's one, there's one thing that sticks out in my mind every time I think about this in Revelations. It says, I think it was, there's a play on this, this locust plague. There was something that cracks open in the earth and people that looked, well it says, a thing comes out with a face like a locust with a sting of a scorpion. Okay, if I remember correctly. Go and check me out. And it will sting them and they would, they wish and they long rather for death because it was so painful and agonizing that they're going through. So whatever this thing is, is an all-consuming, poisonous thing. And if it stings you, it makes you so sick that you literally would wish for death. But they don't make Teshuvah and return to God. They trust rather in their pharmaceuticals, their medicine, their doctors, their hospitals, instead of turning to God for their healing. We trust in what we understand. We trust in what is logical. We trust in what is scientific. You cannot define God by using science. You can only see what He has created. And we're barely even scratching the surface to understand what is outside. I can give you labels of, yes, that leaf works this way because it has little plates that look like solar panels on it and then it sort of creates this process of what we've done, photosynthesis. And we sound all very clever, but we really don't understand. We are just trying to study and trying to figure out what He created. How are we supposed to understand this God? This is what He came to do. He came to teach that He exists, that He knows you, He loves you, He distinguishes between the world and you, and He has no equal. It's going to carry on. And the hell struck the land of Egypt, and everything that was in the field, from human to animal, and the hell struck all the vegetation of the field and shattered every tree <coughs> of the field. This hail is so big that it's busting trees down. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of, where the children of Israel were, there was no hell. Protected. Okay? And Pharaoh sent out and called Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, I send this time. Boy. <laughs> this time. <laughs> only this time. Okay? Only, when, only when, when, when it gets really, really entertaining. You sit down and you come down to this point and he goes, right, okay, I've made a mistake. Hashem is, Hashem is the virtuous one. And I and my people are the wicked ones. Pray to Hashem and enough of their being God's thunders and hail so I might let you go and you won't continue to stay. Okay, okay, I can see. And Moses said to him, As I go out of the city, I'll spread my hands to Hashem. That statement blows my mind. Was he walking with an umbrella while the hailstones were flopping next to him, going, Okay, well, just one minute, please. I'm going to be over here in a minute. Would 
you have enough faith to make a sprint from here to my to the back door with hailstones that are this big falling around you? Oh no, Aaron, okay, we'll sort this out, but it'll only stop once we get outside the city. Where is the Moshe that went, said someone else, please? I can't talk properly. The man of uncircumcised lips who maybe didn't believe the fullness of these promises. He's a folklore. This is crazy. And he's going, no, 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 okay, wait, we'll go pray, but as soon as we get outside, okay, we're in safe, we'll, we'll, we'll pray. He was walking from the inside. <laughs> I don't understand this. He couldn't have walked very far, fast, which is like 80-something. 80, 80 he was 80 years old, coasting with a storm. <laughs> and he's sitting here thinking, no, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll sort you out, don't worry. But only when I get outside. The thunders will stop and the hell won't be anymore, so that you will know that the earth is Hashem's. You and your servants, I know that you do not fear, what, well, sorry, that you don't yet fear in front of Hashem, God. And the flax and the barley were struck because the barley was fresh and the flax was in the bud. Yet the wheat and the spelt were not struck because they were late, they were late crops. God alone says, in my teaching I will not destroy you, I will make sure you have enough bread. In the midst of all of this, He's merciful. And the livestock went out from Pharaoh from the city, and, oh sorry, and Moses went out from Pharaoh and from the city and spread his hands to Hashem and the thunders and the hell stopped and the shower did not come on the earth. And Pharaoh saw that the shower and the hell and the thunder stopped and he continued to sin. He made his heart heavy, he and his servants, and Pharaoh's heart was strong. And he did not let the children of Israel go, as Hashem has spoken by Moses' name. Time and time and time again, God already tells you what's going to happen, how they're going to react. Don't be surprised by what happens. He warns you about their responses before they even get them. And that's not because He has destined someone for destruction. That's because He knows you better than you know yourself. This is what blows my mind. God lovingly uses something so personal so intimate to your life, your relationship with the world, to reach your heart. How many of you have given your life to God over something that seems seemingly insignificant to everybody else? Some small thing happened. Some one little prayer was answered. For me, a real moment was, I was talking to a guy uh, at work, and I was telling him about God and stuff, and he was like, no, no, we don't exist in, you know, real atheists and all the things. A whole bunch of horrific other things, you know, he's like, oh, well, we're all the same. And uh, we were going a little bit of back and forth. And I told him something that really struck home, even though I wasn't 100% living, you know, I call it, I was speaking Christianese. I said what I needed to say to tell you that I believe, but I didn't act like it. I did whatever I wanted to do. And before I left on this first trip to Israel, which was kind of just, okay, come, let's go see what this whole thing is about. I went up to him and, I, and he was talking to me about some of the trials that he was going through. So I said, you know what, Yeshua says, you need to have faith like a mustard seed. And I told him what that meant. You know, because other people had told me. And when we went to Israel, and we went to the Mount of Beatitudes. Um, Uncle Bob took us around. They, 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 they had very funny hours. They closed like between 12 and 1 in the middle of the day. For some unknown reason. And we just happened to catch it like 5 minutes after they closed or 5 minutes before they opened. So he says, okay, no, well, we'll stay here. But let me show you something. And he took us around the back of the church. And uh, you guys know the Sermon on the Mount, right? I bless all those who yeah. came Matthew 5 to 7. And basically at the back of the church, there is this sort of shift. You go there and there's like all broken down things and then there's the other guys like farming on the right hand side. And then in the middle of nowhere was this little sort of caravan stand. I don't know what he was doing there. No one goes behind the church, but he was there. And this is actually more likely where the sermon happened. Because when you go there and you stand on the edge of the platform, what happens is... What 
happens is something like this, is that you're standing on top here, and then it creates sort of this value drifter. You see cars and that down at the bottom, you know. It's quite a massive setup. And this whole area over here creates like a natural theater. Okay, so what happens is you can hear this car, which is about that big, down at the bottom, changing gears. While it's coming up the hill. And it's just like this, the sound carries. So what more than likely happened was that Yeshua would have sat over here near the bottom of the hill, let everybody sit on top of the hill, and his voice would have been carried, speaking quite normally. And everybody would have heard exactly what he needs. <clears throat> and at the top of the sort of, you say like the back end of the place, the rubbish stuff, because the Church of the Attitudes is very beautiful. There was a guy selling just random little odds and socks. And by the way, I've been back seven or eight times and I have never seen him since. And he was selling a little keychain with mustard seeds in it. And that struck me harder than any person's theology, idea, or anything else because not four days ago, I was talking to someone about that very same parable. And that was one of the biggest moments in my life where God just reached down into my heart and He just said, I'm here. I'm real. And not long after that, we had, um, you know, we had a blessing. We went to a place called Yad it was on the river Jordan. And then I gave my life to God. I was baptized in Jordan on that very trip. And He slowly but surely started to reveal Himself to me. His first priority is to show you that He exists. What we call the plagues, one through three, wonders, awesome things that happened. He shook the world to show people He is real. And He reaches down to give them such a testimony that this is still reverberating through history today. Moses' name is not forgotten, even by people who don't understand the Bible. Even by people that don't carry the lineage, they've all heard of the wonders of the plagues of Egypt. Sadly, they don't see the point. I'm real. I can distinguish between you and my people, and I have no people. God's heart is to save His creation, to teach them who He is, and to bring them closer to that understanding so that we can reflect everything He is the way it should be, that it should have been done, the way it will be done by the time it's finished with it. Amen? Amen. Any thoughts, any questions? No. Happiness is. Great times, happy time.